I'd love you to start with just like a little introduction about how you got into what you were doing, both on the rowing and your, your job side, perhaps we can come to later. A little bit of an introduction to how you got into it and how your childhood affected that. Absolutely. Okay. So winding back a little bit, I, as you know, Henry, was a pretty mediocre sportsman. I could hold a rugby ball, but not for very long. I was an okay swimmer. Um, and then I uh, got to age about 15 and uh, I think I first sat on a boat at age 15 and realized that I had a natural aptitude for it. I'm a decent size. I'm about 6'3". And I've naturally got quite good endurance. So obviously too big to be a runner or anything like that, but just the right build to be a rower. And I tried it and um, sort of accidentally won a few races, having not really given it much thought. And then just one thing really led to another. I, I really loved the team aspect of it. Um, uh, and eventually got to the age, I was 17, I had the chance to go to the Junior World Championships. We did that, we won. Um, won a lot of school races and it was really there was never any one moment where I decided I'm going to go to the Olympics I'm going to win the Olympics or anything it just one thing I kept happening after another and it was just a case of taking the opportunities that came my way and making good on them and then it gave me the chance to go to Oxford um, did the boat races got another shot at the Olympics in 2016 where um, yeah where we, we did the deed and I was very happy to walk away from it having achieved all I'd ever wanted to from the sport Constantine, um, I'm going to embarrass you. Uh, first, I'm going to put Zoom to the test also. We're going to try and watch the moment that Constantine takes gold in the Rio Olympics. Forgive me if this doesn't work um, and if you can't hear it, but this is the final 30 seconds from Constantine's race. You know probably where he is. Desperately in the trying to hold off the Italians. Italy pushed GB all the way, almost took them at the line in Sydney. In 2000, Australia threatening to do that now, but it's GB coming home. Is it to be five? Well, there he is. You can see well, him. Is. Five consecutive gold medals in the men's four for GB. <laughs> yeah, that's me on the left. Is the answer? Well, there he Australia. is. We'll finish that. Anyway. That was. I think. I, well, no, it was quite a moment. Well, one thing you can see uh, when you see us lined up there is that I'm the small one. Um, we had a guy in the boat who was about six foot eight, and the others were six six, and now I'm kind of down at six three. So I was a little tip squeak. But no, it was quite something. And the Rio um, setting was amazing. The Lagoa is set in the middle of uh, Rio de Janeiro. So whereas in most Olympics, rowing tends to be cast out to, uh, on the periphery. In Rio, we're really right down the center and you could just see Christ the Redeemer um, up on the, on the hill, on the mountain. Can, can I ask, it's a question I'm sure you've been asked lots of times before and it's, it's probably a, a boring question, but can you just run us through the feeling of crossing that finishing line? Uh, it's really relief, I think. And sometimes when people hear you say that, they seem a bit disappointed. They go, wasn't it elation? Wasn't it, you know, anything else? But relief is a really incredible feeling when you've just been feeling so uptight for so long and so nervous for so long because we went into it as favorites. We were unbeaten that season. And so I think, um, you know, I, I was lucky enough in my career to win some races, which we really didn't expect to win. And, but that was a race we in many ways knew we ought to win, but crossing the line and actually doing it and being able to say, we are now Olympic champions rather than we're just favorites with a target on our back was really, really incredible. Um, and doing it, you know, I, as I said, I love the team aspect. So doing it with other people is great. And, you know, being able to share it with those guys was wonderful. I, can I ask, so we've definitely got some questions to share from those who are, who are watching. So keep those questions coming in. But as everyone knows who's listening, we're big on mentoring. We're big on mentorship and the idea of guidance as you grow up. Did you have some key mentors personally, professionally that are kind of got you to those pinnacles of your career? Mm, it's an interesting question. I, my coach at Oxford was a um, very kind of uh, formative influence. Um, he was very sort of methodical, very scientific about, he did everything, about the way he did everything. Um, quite ruthless in many ways. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I sort of took his training philosophy and ran with it. Um, and then within the team, that there were one or two older athletes who, who sort of led the way a bit. One of whom I'm, I'm still very close to now um, was about 10 years my senior. And where well, he himself is a three-time Olympic gold medalist. And so I've sort of done it all before. A guy called Pete Reed, 
Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so I, I suppose I cite those two people and it's, it's about ingesting some of the lessons and then also, but also finding your own way through it because everyone's a bit different. Can I ask for those who are interested in rowing, can you run us through the, an average day, an average um, day in the life of, a, of an Olympic rower? Absolutely. Well, it's quite um, repetitive. You get up at about 6 a.m. Uh, I would get about four Weetabix in. That was sort of, that wasn't even breakfast. That was just sort of wake up in the, immediately. Um, you go to the gym. The first session is in the gym, uh, lifting weights, because rowing is a little bit unusual in that it's a strength sport and an endurance sport. So if you're a runner or a cyclist, you probably don't do a lot of weights. Uh, you just do aerobic training. But if you're a rower, you need to do a lot of weights. And you also need to do the aerobic training. Um, so in the gym, lifting weights, uh, some of those sort of Olympic lifts you see them do at the Olympics, like, you know, sort of power cleans and things like that. And um, then, uh, then breakfast, so that's sort of big cooked meal. Um, and then out on the water for about 20 kilometers, um, uh, just up and down and up and down this 2K lake somewhere outside Reading, very dreary. Um, and then lunch, uh, and then a nap, sort of long enough to make you a bit groggy and drowsy, not really long enough to let you recover, and then out on the water again, or on the rowing machines. And the coach coaches love the rowing machines, because it's a very kind of regulated environment. They can just watch you on the machine, they see your number, and they can make sure you're working really hard. And by the end of that, you've done almost a marathon's worth of rowing on top of a, a you know, weight session. Um, Sometimes you go away on training camp, but it would be um, mixed up a little bit. We might go to Portugal or Spain or, or somewhere sunnier, really just to break up the monotony and to draw ourselves away from, um, you know, daily distractions and the commute. Can I ask also, uh, you know, you've had a plethora of great Olympic experiences across two different Olympic Games. London, which some kids listening might not remember so well, but was obviously a huge thing for, for everyone here nationally. And then in Rio as well, four years later. Do you have a kind of most ridiculous moment from those Olympic experiences? Um, it would probably be something from London because whilst Rio was where we won the gold, London was uh, surreal because it was, it's where I grew up. I'm sure it's where a lot of the people watching, you know, are or have grown up or, you know, know it well. And suddenly seeing my home city transformed into the kind of beating heart of this global event was incredible. And there was one day where I had a friend who worked on the organizing committee and he said to me, would you like a ticket to go and see the final of the, of the women's beach volleyball in the Royal Box, which was on Horse Guards Parade? And I said, of course, I, you know, I bit his hand off. I said, of course I would. And I went and sat there. I got in there. There was sort of talk of a VIP coming to meet us. And then David Beckham walked in front of us with his two boys. And so we all got very excited. Thought, oh, that's a VIP. And then... A minute later, Prince Harry came and sat down literally right next to me. Um, he was much more interested in the lady to his right than in me. But uh, we, we were just sitting there, Prince Harry to my right, David Beckham literally right in front of me and ended up getting sort of papped by the Daily Mail and others. It was just totally surreal. <laughs> we can only dream. Um, there's a, a couple of questions that have come in, Constantine, that I, I thought we could touch on. Um, and it, it sort of came into what I want to talk about as well. Yesterday, we asked an author um, about how she quantifies success. And I, I've heard that the worst moment sometimes in an Olympic um, sportsman or sportswoman's moment at the time is, is the moment they win that gold medal. Um, how do you calibrate success once that's happened? Was that the reason you stopped? Yeah, I, it's, it's a good question. I think often people do get a sense of anticlimax because they've been building into something for four years or eight years or even longer. Um, and then they get it. And I think everyone feels that moment of elation right there and then, but it's when you get back to your hotel room, you think, oh, well, what now? Um, I, didn't, I didn't really have that. I was lucky. I went into it so determined to leave the sport after Rio because I was 24 in Rio and I thought, you know, I've had a great run and um, that's a good age to go off and do something else and, and find a career rather than being stuck in the sport in a position where I might make it into my 30s and then not really, not really up, you know, know what the onward path was from there. So I was really prepared, I think, mo mentally for that kind of break and that, that sort of down moment where you think, oh, God, well, I've done the thing now and, and kind of now what? Great. My friends and family are all rather pleased with me, but now what? Um, it helped that I had a bit of a, a break period where I went traveling and gave myself a bit of breathing room to think about what to do next. 
Um, but, you know, I, I think I hadn't pinned everything on the idea of winning gold. I think you, you hear some athletes and they just say, this means everything to me. I think Steve Redgrave always meant that when he said it. He really meant it. It was really everything to him. And I'd be sort of like, you're taking a big emotional risk there with yourself, I think. You're really staking so much on that. And if it doesn't come off, there's just no consolation at all. Um, I, was, I was lucky that it happened, um, but I think I, I kind of, you know, uh, made a route out for myself as it was. Mm. Um, I've got a question in terms of kind of reflecting a few of the things that have been asked here. What advice do you have for the younger generation in terms of those who have sporting ambitions and how to follow them correctly alongside studies, but also, you know, doing themselves the right good service in their preparation if they've, if they've got ambitions? Yeah, I'm conscious, first of all, that all sports are, are different. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm sure that there are some lessons for, from rowing that are more applicable than others. I would say, you know, I think obviously worked really hard at it. I think the harder you work at it, the more you will get out. And of course, it is partially nature, it's partially nurture, genetics come into it. But the harder you work, the better you will do at it, almost regardless of what sport it is. But... Um, you know, don't just don't do it to the exclusion of everything else. Uh, you know, academic work is still really important. Uh, fulfilling university ambitions, if you have them, still really important. Um, don't, as I, as slightly as I said with the gold medal, don't stake everything on it. And, and don't, um, yeah, just, just, you know, work really hard at it to maximize your, the, your output from it, but don't sacrifice everything else for it right now. You know, if it becomes clear that you can go to the Olympics or you can, um, I don't, you know, it, do the equivalent in whatever sport you may choose to do, that's the point at which to really double down. But at this stage, I think just, just work really hard at whatever you're doing, but maintain, maintain that kind of diversity of experience between academics and sports and whatever Very else. A very level-headed response from a very level-headed gentleman. I like it. <laughs> it finally brings me on to something I wanted to ask about, which is that your new life, or not so new anymore, but the work you do now, you're part of a hugely successful, growing, internationally known business. You've, you've come from the sport world, clearly very employable as you are. What lessons have you learned from your life in sport that are now applicable to the rest of your life? And I suppose, how's that transition been? Yeah, gosh. I mean, there's so much to say about this. I think some lessons are really applicable and some are really not. And to sum that up, I mean, I use this very crude analogy of climbing a hill. And if you're doing sport, climbing, you know, you sort of, it's straight up, it's sort of straight up, you know where you're going, you've got a clear line of sight, there are no big obstacles, but every, or, or no barriers to, to visibility, but every step is hard work. It's just hard graft all the way to the top and you've got a coach telling you exactly what you need to do. You don't need to use your intuition just hard but it's simple whereas in the real world um you know it may not always be super steep but you've got um barriers and obstacles you've got to wiggle around them the path kind of turns and twists um and you've got to use a lot of intuition and take a lot of risks to get where you want to go um and that's what i found that in in rowing it was it was always very simple you just execute executed on the session you knew what you needed to do and you sort of had a reasonable degree of confidence that if you worked hard enough at it you'd get your just desserts out of it. Um, and, in, and in the real world, it's just, you know, it's just not like that. There's so much luck, there's so much uncertainty. But I think it's still important to know that if you put a lot of hard work in, enough of those opportunities will come good. Where the lessons are applicable is, um, it's, it's, it's the other side of the same coin, really. It's knowing, it's really being able to perform under pressure um, uh, and being able to endure discomfort. I think. So, you know, there are times in any job where pressure's on, you've got to perform in front of a lot of people, you, maybe you've got to give a speech or you've got to present a, an idea to someone or something and, and being able to perform under pressure and hold your nerve is really important and sport definitely teaches you that because that moment when you're on the start line in Rio or whatever it is and you know you've got to condense four years of hard work into six minutes of execution is pretty daunting or if you're Usain Bolt or, you know, 100 meters, you've got to do it all in nine and a half seconds or 10 seconds or whatever.